Arfield. What a volley! Scott Arfield! He's been threatening that recently. And all the Burnley players run to the Darwin end. Burnley win the next ball. It's a Rory now. It's on the outside. He's on the Quickly finds Benson in space at the byline. Can Burnley get a goal here? Back for Browno. Saved by the keeper. Yeah! Burnley won it to the end. That is magnificent. They deserve that. Only by Phil Fatella. Off for a hat trick. He's got it. Hat trick for Nathan Teller. Oh, he's on fire at the minute. 3 0 Burnley. It's Nathan Teller's day. And Burnley are three. And he's on the outside, comes inside, comes out the shot. Oh, what a goal! Manuel Benson once more. That is top class. Burnley have done it. Fantastic. Clarence deserved the championship title. They've been the best side throughout the campaign. Burnley have won the second tier. What a fantastic achievement. The players have been magnificent. Yes, hello everyone and welcome back to the channel and welcome along to another instalment of the Turfcast podcast pre-game show ahead of this weekend's game against Portsmouth at Turf Moor. A team that we haven't played since 2012. It's been a while since we've played Pompey. It's been a while since we've welcomed them to Turf Moor and we've only been doing the podcasts and the YouTube stuff since 2018. So it will be the first time that I speak to a Portsmouth fan on this channel and as always on the pre-game show we do get a fan of the opposition in and i'm delighted to welcome you andrew from the po forecast how are you doing mate yeah good go with andy unless you're mad at me if that's cool and, but, uh, right, yeah. okay sorry it's it's and i, I just it, it, i think you're andrew on whatsapp mate i think that's how it came up um so oh, i just went with that uh, anyway yeah thank you for having me lovely to be here yeah, yeah, yeah nice to be the first Pompey fan on your show <laughs> Yeah, it might be the Excel sheet rather than WhatsApp, or I'm actually an idiot. Um, but yeah, anyway, no, welcome. Uh, it's been a while, hasn't it, since Burnley and Portsmouth have, have played each other. Um, I, I remember the days, uh, I, I don't want to go full, you know, uncle on, on everybody, um, but I remember the days when obviously we were both in the Premier League, we both got relegated in the same year, then we spent a couple of years in the Championship against each other, uh, and then you obviously went on your well-documented, so, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to rub it in, but your well-documented sort of like fall down the leagues. But it's good to see you back, mate. Welcome back to the championship thank you yes it is nice to be back we haven't really had much to celebrate as yet but having said that the novelty of you know playing teams that bring more than 25 fans to Fratton Park is is still there so having over 20,000 in the ground at Fratton because the away team you know they actually bring fans is it's nice after some of those league two days where uh, you just yeah. question a lot of your life choices when you're going to these games week in week out and just you're losing against a team who there are more players and substitutes than there are fans in the stadium. So, yeah, nice to be back in the big-ish time, albeit not having scored at home off our own players' bodies yet. Yeah, well, we'll get into that in a second. But obviously, Burnley I, I had, a, had a very well-documented fall down the leagues a little bit before my time, probably a little bit before more at your time in the 1980s, uh, and nearly went out of the league altogether as well. So we've done a similar thing, took us a little bit longer. Um but yeah, so, uh, some some of the older Burnley fans watching this will, will, will completely relate to what you've just said about you know the the low attendances and mm. and questioning your life choices. But just one question before the weekend: Do you still have that annoying prat with the bell? Is he is he still around? Yeah, so he's just come back from a, a stadium ban. But uh, yeah, oh, God, <laughs> he is back around. I've got to be careful what I say when it's being published. He's not he's not the most popular with a lot of away uh, with a lot of opposition fans and certainly divides opinion within our own fan base. Let's say that. Uh, yeah. Don't want to say anything um, that gets you in trouble, but divides opinion is probably the correct term. He is still around. Um, a couple of people from his little troop aren't around for reasons I would leave your fans to go and have a Google of because they've probably got some words in that would get you demonetized on YouTube. But uh, yeah, go and have a have a Google. But yeah, he is still around and the, the bell and the drums are still around. And uh Yeah. That's that's yeah. That's the answer I'm going to stick with. 
I'm going to, I am going to Google him. Uh, I, I, all I remember is his name was John Portsmouth Football Club, then whatever his last name was. Uh, but I'm sure, I can, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm, sh- I'm going to mm. say I'm sure I can find it. Um, but uh, no, massive respect to the guy. I, I don't know his background or anything, but massive respect to the guy for following Portsmouth up and down the country. He's been doing it for years. It's just, I hate the noise of that constant bell. It just winds me up. And that's why I used to hate playing you back in the day, just because of him. I went to Fratton a couple of times, I say a couple of times, once, and he was very prominent then, very loud. Um, it's good to see, in a way, again, not referencing any of his background that you've just kind of referenced yourself there or some of his friends, but respect for that anyway. Anyway, let's get into the football side of it. You've already mentioned that the Championship's not kind of treating you so well at the minute. I have been looking, obviously, yet to win a game, but you did draw your first three games. You have lost a couple of games, but that were against two of the sides that are up there at the minute and expected to be up there at the end of the season. You've had a couple of decent draws, you know, a draw away at Ellen Road, but everyone's getting points there these days. Um, And obviously a draw at home to Luton, who were in the Premier League last season, albeit a small club, but were in the Premier League last season, obviously leads the favourites to go up. So what's been your season so far but what was your thoughts on your season so far are you happy with it frustrated definitely not frustrated it's been a very odd first few games the first three games we played so that draw against Leeds the draw against Middlesbrough and the draw against Luton the Leeds and the Middlesbrough game we should both have lost and won somehow at the same time I mean Leeds I mean they hit the the crossbar three times in the first six minutes. Keeper had a good game. They should have been about five goals up, and yet we were still 3-2 up going into the last minute. So riddled me that. I don't know how we ended up drawing that game. Middlesbrough, again, I think they had 30 3-0 shots in the match, and they weren't all from pot shots from distance. But again, we were 2-1 up going into the last couple of minutes of the game and didn't see it out and got a draw from the game. Luton had their goalkeeper sent off after half an hour. And that ended up being a nil-nil draw where, again, both teams could have won the game. So it was a a very odd start to the season where we'd have snapped your hands off for three points from three games when it's those three teams playing against. But we were, you know, so close to getting no points from the three games. But also, there's a decent argument, you know, that we should have picked up seven or nine points from the first three games. And if our games were 89 minutes long, we would have, you know, had seven points instead of three. Unfortunately, football isn't 89 minutes long. But then, yeah, we played against Sunderland, who honestly were excellent. I, I was really surprised to see them get turned over by Plymouth. And yeah. then West Brom, who we let in a very, very basic goal after 54 seconds to the first half. We were then the better side for the rest of the first half, but just couldn't convert any of our chances. And then West Brom just blunted us completely in the second mm. half. So... None of the games I've really felt like we've been like outclassed, for want of a better word. Yeah. We were the better side for chunks of a number of those games, but we're just not clinical enough in front of goal to the level you need to be in the championship. But mm. these these first seven, eight games aren't deciding our season. We've had that, we had the difficult start. We've got you guys, then we've got Sheffield United. Yeah. And then we start playing teams that you wouldn't expect to be in or around the playoffs or automatics at the start of the season. And it's that sort of start of October through to Christmas that I think is going to really tell us whether or not we've got a fighting chance this season. Yeah, no, you're definitely not defined by these by these games. But that was my next point. You have had a difficult start. You've played a lot of teams up there. You've still got ourselves who we expect to be up there. You've got Sheffield United, as you've referenced. Mm. So it has been a tough start. But... How are you feeling that when, when you look at these games and obviously I presume at the start of the season your aim was survival, right? I presume oh, it still is now. Yeah. yeah. How are you feeling on that? Or, or do you think it's too difficult to stay at this stage because you haven't really played anyone else that's going to be down there with you? Yeah, honestly, probably the latter. I think mm-hmm. we'll know more when we've played without wanting to throw any teams under the bus will be disrespectful, but teams who look like they're going to be nearer that end of the table. So people like Cardiff, people like Millwall, people like maybe Preston, People like QPR, who I'm imagining are going to finish 16th or 18th because that's just all they really seem to do. Those sort of teams, I'm imagining, are going to be the teams that we need to be picking up points against. So looking at how we've played, like our chance creation in some of these games has been really good, Mm -hmm. other than possibly the Sunderland game. Our chance creation has been excellent, um, even though our expected goals is something like 1.62 from five games or something along those lines. It's very, very low. but 
that makes me question the metric slightly. There have been glimpses that tell me that I think we'll be all right, but there are a couple of, well, maybe three areas in the side that we can probably mention that we're particularly vulnerable or we have been particularly vulnerable. And if those don't get fixed, yeah. we could struggle come the end of the season. But some of those are injury related. So, yeah, you'd hope that we'd come back from that. What are them vulnerabilities then? Because you've already mentioned already that you're not clinical enough in front of goal. We've been the exact opposite. We've been very clinical. We've got a low XG uh, as well. Uh, but again, it, I question the metric on that because I look back at some of the early games and I think we had like four one-on-ones in the first two games. Um, but anyway, but we put four past Luton and then five past Cardiff. All right, we haven't we haven't done that since. Um, but from the outside looking in, you've obviously, you look like you're leaking goals as well. You could seem to be conceding quite a few goals as well. So it's kind of a recipe for disaster, isn't it? If, if you can't put the ball in the back of the net and you are leaking goals, but again, not to, not to make you, you know, downbeat, you have played a lot of the top side. So what are them vulnerabilities in your head that you've got? Yeah. I keep thinking of more. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be here and sort of slating on the team because a lot of them are unavoidable. Things like, you know, being less clinical in front of goal is largely because Colby Bishop was diagnosed with a heart condition and had heart surgery before the season started and then he's out for at least six months. Totally yeah. legit. Things like Cassini Yengi, who is our other, you'd say, good number nine or natural number nine, will also be missing this game because he tweaked his groin in the warm-up against, um, against West Brom at the weekend. So we've not had the best of luck with our injuries and our attacking positions, if you can call an underlying cardiac condition an injury. I guess it falls in the same bracket. Yeah, central defensive midfield. We haven't really found a, a partnership that works yet. So it's been Marlon Pack and Andre Dozel, uh, with Dozel taking the place of it. It was normally Joe Morel last season who went off to I want to say Wrexham possibly, but that hasn't really clicked. And you could see in the West Brom game at the weekend, Dozel isn't where Pack thinks he's going to be when Pack executes a high press or closes down the opposition or drops deep. Dozel isn't dropping into the gap. And those two have not clicked really in the slightest, to be honest, to the extent it wouldn't surprise me against you to see uh, Dozel drop from the 11 for the first time and someone like Freddie Potts coming in, who we've signed uh, from West Ham, who was with Wickham last season and is very highly rated. Yeah. Uh, third area of difficulty, it's probably been the centre-back pairing, again, largely through injury. So we've had Regan pull out with an ACL and then I think picked up another injury, but was the ACL was the long-term one. Tom McIntyre, we signed from Reading last season. Uh, I think we paid £75,000 for him. He paid 53 minutes and then broke his ankle getting sent off. So he's only just come back this weekend, gone. Um, who am I missing? Duh, 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 duh. I'm definitely missing one of our centre-backs. That's not great. Oh, Connor Shocknessy as well. Has uh, had some, I think, calf issues at the start of this season. So basically our three first-choice centre-backs, all unpickable. So what we've yeah. ended up with is Riley Towler playing as the one sort of established centre-back who wasn't our first choice in League One. And he's been playing alongside Jordan Williams, who is a right-back by trade and is filling in at right centre-back. And when you're playing, you know, five of the top six teams in the championship and you've mm. got a right-back playing at right centre-back and a left centre-back who wasn't even first choice in the league below, you're not in a great starting point. And then I think the the final place we've probably struggled a little bit is in left-back position with Conor Ogilvy. He's under a bit of pressure, I would say, from some parts of the fan base now. He's probably been, if you had to pick a weak link, if you if you use that phrase, you'd probably pick out him so far. So if you're focusing your attack on either wing, I'd probably suggest you focus down your right wing. Um, in terms of pace, he's had some tough assignments. You know, coming up against Dan James in game week one was... Yeah. You know, we gave him a bit of a free pass there because that's a very tough gig. And uh, even against Sunderland, you know, coming up against people like Chris Rigg and, and uh, Joe Bellingham, you give a bit of leeway, but pace-wise has been shown up a bit. And it was that side where we conceded after 54 seconds at the weekend, if you watch that goal. It was a simple throw-in from the right wing that, you know, Ogilvy didn't quite have the pace to track his man who was between him and the left centre-back and pull back and bam, and then you're one nil down in a minute. So yeah. that's kind of been a bit of an issue. But we do have got Jacob Farrell coming back uh, from injury, who who's a left-back as well, but we haven't really seen anything of him yet. So I'm not convinced he'd come straight into the starting eleven. There's a few yeah, weaknesses, basically, at this yeah. point. I don't know how long <laughs> it's 
the, the the ones you've mentioned there that stand out to me are your fullbacks, and you've said any pace, and uh, I can't remember his name, but he's he's absolutely done for on our right hand side. We've been playing Luke. I don't know how well you know Burnley and uh, how we play, but we do see to focus play down the wings from what we can see so far under Scott Parker ball. And um, Luca Colliosho is absolutely rapid, like to the point where I've got my little boy a season ticket, a season ticket this year for the first time. And every time Luca sprints, he just turns around to me. He's like, oh, how fast is he? He's so fast, but he's absolutely Excellent. rapid. So that sounds to me like we could prioritise that area. If, if we've done our own work, and Scott, if you're watching this, Anyone from the football club watching this, send this to Scott. Prioritize the fullbacks, but again, just just to just to stick with you and uh, obviously you mentioned there are a lot of weak areas. Let's try and spin a more positive thing on it for you. What who are your danger men? Who are the sort of players that we should be looking out for? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have got danger men. I'm, I don't want to come here and slam the team because I think they're probably performing above the sum of their, of their parts considering the injury crisis we've had. Uh, so Josh Murphy started for the first time on our left wing. Uh, the weekend just gone and he was kind of the shining light of that game. So we signed him from Oxford at the end of last season and then he picked up an injury immediately in the off-season and uh, hadn't featured for us in the league until this weekend just gone. And the thing about Josh Murphy, he's got pace, but also very good with both feet. So a lot of our left-wingers in the last couple of years have been very one-footed. We had Abu Kamara, who's now at Hull, uh, on our left wing a lot of last season. Fantastic player, but you knew what he was going to do when he got to the byline because he has only really got one foot. So, yeah, Josh Murphy, I'd certainly pick out. Callum Lang, who's been playing mostly at 10, uh, has certainly got a lot of about him. He's he's looked very natural in the championship and has been one of the few players that has consistently caused opposition players' issues so far. Other players have burned hot and cold, but Lang is, you know, I don't think he's had what I'd call a, an ordinary or a bad game as yet. And then... I mean, in goal, Will Norris has had a, a generally a very good start to the season. We brought Will in Norris, a... Will Norris, forgot about him. Yeah, he's, he's done a good job, to be fair. His, his distribution hasn't been quite as good as last season, as yet. Shot stopping has been generally good, with the exception of the third goal against Sunderland, where he got beaten near post. But at that point, it didn't really matter, to be honest with you. But um, he's made some... I mean, if you haven't seen it, check out his save at the weekend against West Brom. Um, where he sort of clawed it back with his right hand. And I didn't realise we had goal line technology in the championship. This is how new we are to the championship, by the way. <laughs> didn't even know we had goal line technology, but um, obviously at the game, just saw it not given and assumed the lino had made the call. But there's literally that much of the ball hadn't crossed the line and he's sort of clawing yeah. it from behind. It's such a good save. So he's had generally a good season so far as well. Uh, we brought in a a number two keeper to challenge him and the number two keeper hasn't had a hasn't had a look in as soon as he brought he got brought in Norris started sort of standing out compared to his teammates in the game so there are certainly some players to watch there and you know with these players coming back from injury it, it genuinely it's going to be quite difficult for us to predict the lineup this weekend we're still missing Yengi we're still missing Shocknessy um it's unlikely that Shocknessy will be around and we're missing Omani who is this uh, forward we signed uh, I think on loan, for, it must be on loan, from Brighton uh, for the season. So it's kind of hard to predict the lineup, but there are some X-Factor players in there. They just haven't quite clicked as a cohesive unit yet. And I yeah. don't think we've seen them play against sides that have allowed that. Like the, the high press from Sunderland was genuinely incredible to watch. It was so above anything we saw in League One. They were really, really good. And generally teams just haven't let us play our game in the way that in League in League One we were able to. So, yeah. yeah, kind of waiting to play against a few teams where we're able to do that more before before making a big judgment. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Interesting you mentioned that high press from Sunderland there. We kind of fell victim to that as well. They just just wouldn't let us play out. We just we just struggled mm. at all to get out of it. Um, I do want to talk to you though about your style of play. Like, are you how how are you? Ex you said it's going to be difficult for you to to predict the lineup, and that's fair enough. But how are you expecting Sun not Sunderland, sorry, Portsmouth to set up? Because we've had a few uh, games, a couple of games at the turf this season. One where Cardiff tried to play against us and just ended up being demolished, and one where Blackburn just just sat back and said, "No, nope, you break us down now." How are you expecting Portsmouth to set up? It won't be the latter unless things completely changed overnight. We I haven't seen a game other than, I think, Bolton away towards the end of last season. I can't think of a game where we've just sat back and let teams play at us. 
I think we made a mistake on that day and I think Messino's realised that it doesn't suit the players we had then and it doesn't suit the players we have now. So I really don't think you're going to see us coming and sitting with you know two banks behind the ball, partially because defensively we aren't good enough to see out 90 mm. minutes. I don't think many teams are in the championship because every other team has got players so good to, you know, over 90 minutes, if you do attack versus defence, you're not going to keep a clean sheet. Uh, so I think we'll generally play a fairly open game. So we will line up 4-2-3-1, unless Messino tries to reinvent the wheel again before the weekend, which I'd be very, very surprised by. Uh, we will invite a high press, for sure. Um, I know it's the, the done thing nowadays in, in modern football is to be yeah. very comfortable playing it across your own goal in your own penalty box and have one of your centre-backs taking goal kicks and inviting the opposition to press into your own box. We will do that. Um, generally, what we try and do is keep the ball in the back four, find the right moment to play it forward on the ground to one of the central defensive midfielders. And then we try and find a pocket and play it out to one of the wings to either uh, it'll be Josh Murphy or Paddy Lane, potentially on, on one of the wings. What Sunderland did really well was they they stopped the second phase of that from happening. So we played the ball out to our two central defensive midfielders facing our own goal. And then they just got smothered by yeah. Sunderland's yeah, midfielders. And Sunderland's attacking players then advanced beyond the ball and closed down our back four. So they just there was no pass available for, for them to do. So that's that's what Sunderland did successfully, and I'd imagine you'd try and do as well. But yeah, it'll yeah. be a four-two-three-one. I mean, where we looked dangerous at the weekend was Josh Murphy cutting in and, and Paddy Lane cutting in from the from the wings. That is where most of our threat, I think, will come. Callum Lang's got a fairly free role at ten, assuming we do the same with him as we have been in in recent games. So it could pop up anywhere really. But yeah, it won't. I don't think it'll be boring football. We'll try and play attractive football because it suits the players we've got not just you know we like playing good football and we want to make it a good match if we don't do that I think we'd struggle more we're more yeah. likely to win games you know three two four three than we are to grind out a one nil with a rear guard action it, do, it wouldn't be us at all I don't think but obviously that hasn't worked out too well this year because the opposite teams we've played have just had too much quality uh hoping you have an absolute nightmare of a, an afternoon but uh not overly confident. Yeah, I, w I was going to say like the, the, you sound pretty similar to us in that sense, where it's a similar formation, similar style of play, inviting the press. Like you said, it's the done thing these days. But I'm just thinking that like if if we are going to match up against each other, I would be confident that we'd have the better quality. And what you were saying about Sunderland and the press and how you struggled with it, I wouldn't say our press was as good as what we saw against Sunderland when we played them. But I would suspect that you know we'd be able to do something similar to what Sunderland did. Fingers crossed. Anyway, um, I just want to—I don't—I don't want to throw you under the bus or anything here at the minute. But I do always like to get people's sort of like predictions. Well, not predictions. Sorry, mm -hmm. thoughts on Burnley and, and and some of the players that that you're most worried about this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Obviously, I don't watch you week in, week out, or even week in for that matter. Uh, but I think realistically, you're going to be there or thereabouts. Most of the stuff I saw about Burnley in the off season was to do with financial hitting and money spent, and you know, net it, net uh, net spend, money in, money out. So, yeah. without I mean, having seen a huge amount of you this season, you had did you have a heavy defeat first game, or was it first game was a poor performance? No, I heard first about. game we beat we beat we beat Luton four one at Luton. Um, okay, that's but, not the one then. Yeah, it, we, we didn't play that well in a weird way, but we're comfortable winners easily. Comfortable winners. Then we beat Cardiff five nil uh, off the top of my head, um, and then we played Sunderland. Um, if I miss if I miss one here, <laughs> Burnley fans, apologies. Then we played Sunderland up at Sunderland where we uh, lost one nil. Then we played Blackburn at home where we took a lead early on and they got the you know the, the the fluke long-range goal from Vyman, uh, and then they just sat back and we couldn't break them down. Uh, and then it was Leeds at the weekend where we won 1-0 at Ellen Road. So mm. we haven't been playing great. There's like four games there that I mentioned where we haven't really played that well, but we've been getting, yeah. we've, been, we've been doing game plans very, very well. Like we said to Luton, like, okay, you come at us and then we'll just pick you off. Uh, Cardiff, we just dominated. Like if I say dominated, we we weren't that good, but we were just so much better than them, if that makes sense. Sunderland, yeah. we struggled, um, but there were some mitigating circumstances surrounding the transfer market and things like that at that point. Blackburn, admittedly, we struggled to break them down. They got set, their man sent off as well on like the 60th, 70th minute, but they just sat in and we just struggled to break them down. Then they countered us and, and 
potentially could have won the match. Uh, mm. And then obviously Leeds at the weekend, great win. Um, but I think we had like 25, 30% possession and it, uh, some fans left saying, all right, yes, we've won, but that wasn't a great watch. I personally don't care. Um, so there's been a few I'll take a win with, uh, with 25% exactly. possession. Exactly. Anyone who's complaining about that, that now. in my opinion. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's been a good start for us. Obviously, I think we're about mm. fourth. I don't really check the league table so far. Yeah, I think you're fourth. Uh, yeah, um, but we've, you know, we, we put it this way, we've had a better start after the first five games this time than what we did under Vincent Company when we broke all the records except the points record. So it, it's been a good okay. start for us, mate. It's been a good start for us, but there's okay, been some but... not great performances in there, if that makes sense. Yeah, what I've heard is, that the, heard is that a couple of the performances haven't been brilliant. Um, in terms of the players that jump out, just pulling up your squad from the Leeds game, Josh Cullen, I used to sign on Football Manager on a fairly regular basis a few years brilliant, ago. And obviously, yeah, that's a very good uh, way of measuring the success of a player. So I'd, I'd be keeping an eye out for him. Jay Rodriguez is going to get, a, if, if people realise, which I'm sure they will, uh, a, a nice reception from the Pompey fan base. Yeah, if he plays. Ties with yeah. And uh, yeah, with the, the fan base is normally pretty hot on that. Um, you know, you get one person who's made one sub appearance for three minutes for Southampton under 21s and they just get pelters for the entire game. So, you know, I'd imagine him to get a bit of a reception. Um, but again, seen a decent amount of him play from Premier League and Championship, so I'd be keeping an eye out for him. And weirdly, John Egan as well, I used to see quite a lot of. Was it Sheffield United he was at previously? Yeah, again, he's another one that probably won't play. We've actually okay. only just signed him, I think, about five, six, no, more than that. About At the time of recording this, probably about a week ago, um, Okay. Obviously, he was training with us in the summer, got released by Sheffield United, but he's, he's not the starting centre-back at the minute. It's uh, Esteve and uh, Warrow, I think, will, will be the okay. two centre-backs. And same with Jay Rodriguez. I don't, he's, he might <coughs> on the bench and get a bit of a reception from you guys, mm. um, but we'll see what happens with Jay. Yeah, I think the only one, other one is uh, obviously jumps off the page is James Trafford. Was going to be the next yeah. big thing. I don't know. Maybe he still will be. I have no idea. Next cab off yeah. the rank at some point. But to be honest with you, touchy you subject had... amongst Burnley fans is Trafford. But he was absolutely fantastic against Leeds. To be fair, okay. he was brilliant. Yeah, really, really good. Okay. I mean, you've had a decent amount of squad turnover, haven't you? So I'm looking at your squad and not seeing a huge amount I recognise from last season from from what I saw. So I feel slightly uneducated, honestly. Being <laughs> on our pod, we spend so long in League One, League Two. I don't think there are many people in the country who, who know more about the, the players going around the League One, League Two circuit. And we're coming into the yeah. championship and having to start from scratch, really. I mean, give me Bert and Albion, you know, talking about their reserve squad depth. I'll, I'll talk to you for hours. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> having to learn a little bit about some, some quite good squads. Uh, so far, I've been learning about them because I, I Google them after they score against us. Yeah, fair enough. It's uh, it, yeah, we have had uh, just off the top of my head. Obviously, I've not got the stats up in front of that. I think we sold sixteen players and brought okay. you know thirteen or twelve in. So that's fair enough on that point. We we have had a a high turnover, but I've already mentioned Luca Colliosho already. He's mm. He's rapid, mate. I genuinely watch out for him on the right wing. He probably will start unless he's picked up an injury. Uh, Josh Brown, obviously, he's one of the um, he's one of the, the the top midfielders in this league, in my opinion. He's one of the midfielders, as is Josh Cullen. Um, but Josh Brown, I always find that is uh, one of the best players in the championship, or one of the best midfielders in the championship at least. But then can't really make the step up to the Premier League. But he might see that a little bit differently. Uh, Jaden Anthony is another one to look out for. He's done quite well since coming in. Uh, another one that we signed at the summer. Um, Maxime Esteve, I genuinely believe he is one of, if not the best defender in the championship. He is brilliant. But again, that's obviously Burnley bias. Um, so I did put a post up about that saying, who's the best? If, if this guy isn't the best defender in the championship, who is? And everybody come back at me saying, obviously, it's not him. It's this random guy you've never heard of. Even a Plymouth fan were telling me some random Plymouth guy was. But so it, it's always that sort of case, isn't it? It's you always have yeah. I, I don't think you're going to get many Pompey fans claiming we've got any of the best players in the division at this point. If that makes <laughs> you feel better, you'll probably get a slightly different vibe. We're just happy yeah, to be you. here, to be honest with you. We're, we're loving <laughs> yes. every second of it. Well, mate, I wish you all the success, obviously, after Saturday, which is usually my closing line, and we're not closing yet, by the way, so people don't turn off. Obviously, I need to get you your sorry, I need to get your predictions from you for the game. So, score predictions, please, mate. Yeah, I mean, I pride myself on not predicting Portsmouth losses. So our prediction game has kind of gone out the window a little bit so far this season. I'll absolutely snap your hand off and take a two-all draw. I, I cannot see us keeping a clean sheet. I think either we'll have a bit of a makeshift back four or we'll mm. have a back four of people playing in their preferred positions but who haven't played together for a good chunk of time. Either way, 
it's going to be you know difficult to keep a clean sheet or anything close to it. So I'll go with a two-all draw because I think I do think we have some potency going forward, more than the stats would suggest so far this season. And I mean, we we were creating good chances against West Brom, and there were signs that things were starting to click in that first half. We outplayed them for a decent chunk of the first half. So we'll go with a two-all. That is my heart speaking, not my head. <laughs> don't ask me what my head says. I don't want it on record. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. I remember predicting on Man City podcasts last year and Arsenal podcasts a 1-1 just because mm. I was doing the exact same thing as you. Knowing deep down it would not be 1-1. Um, I think I'm going to go... I were going to go 2-0, but just after looking at some of your results, I think we could potentially score a bit more, but we may even concede. So 3-1 to Burnley. And again, I'll take that. It's always a tough game um, when you're playing you know, a team that's recently come up and still pretty, you know, happy and, you know, riding on the crest of a wave somewhat. All right, you've not won mm. yet this season, but you've still got the positive from last season. Um, yeah. We'll wrap it up there then, mate, uh, if that's all right with you. But one thing I always do before we go is give you the chance to sort of like push yourself, let people know where they can find you in any any ports of content that they may want to digest before the weekend or after the weekend. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of your listeners want to listen to our reaction to a famous Portsmouth win come next week. So if you want to find us, <laughs> Chatting through how awful Burnley were. Yeah, we are uh, on on Twitter or X. We are at PO Forecast, so it's the first part of our postcode, and then C A S T, which by the way is a terrible name for a podcast because if you type it into Google, it says, "Did you mean podcast?" and then it shows you all the results of the podcast <laughs> yeah. instead of PO Forecast. But yeah, you can find us on on Twitter with that or at Pompey News Now on Twitter as well or Instagram or Facebook or any of them. But uh. Yeah, we're on also on SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify. We're probably somewhere else. But yeah, all, all your main podcast providers. But yeah, uh, yeah. we have a, a wonderful Burnley guest this week who I'm sure is going to be absolutely fantastic when we record uh, later on this evening, right? So uh, if people want to hear even more of your dulcet tones, they can <laughs> they can join us. Yeah, you can hear me waxing lyrical on that channel as well if you really want to listen to pretty much the same show again. Um, but yeah, I, I always do like, cause I'm, I'm one of them. Like I say, if we beat you uh, on Saturday, I probably will head over to your channel on like Monday and just kind of like get the vibe of what you're saying. Um, there's a few, uh, channels. I won't mention any channels, but there's a few hashtags and stuff that I do like to go on quite a lot. Everton mainly, um, because I do, I do love an Everton meltdown. Bradford City as well, when they were melting down a lot, but they seem to be doing a bit better now, so it's not as fun. Mm. Now. Um, so, yeah. But anyway, uh, we'll wrap it up there, mate. Fingers crossed. Good luck for the rest of the season. Thank Obviously, you. Um, just on that, go, but at the moment, Bolton, absolute basket case. It's fantastic viewing. Yeah, actually, that's a very good shout. Mm. I'm not, we, we are not the biggest fans of Bolton, actually, now you mention it. Oh, it's a wonderful um, read at the moment. Honestly, they're, yeah, well, they're they've had a point to the, the fourth Huddersfield goal. And then, you know, yeah, it's one, they're one of those clubs where every goal they concede, the replies to the tweets, there are more and more and more of them. Then you get to the full-time tweet and there's about 500, reply, 500 replies. It's beautiful at the moment. And uh, there's a few angry people at Peterborough as well. So there's... You know, it makes us feel better when we go home from exactly our big losses. That. Yeah, I mean, it could exactly be worse. The, the the Everton the Everton spaces are genuinely famous, infamous, should I say? <laughs> and they are absolutely fantastic. I love them. But Bolton's another one that I'll definitely be checking out. Not mm. too bothered about Peterborough, to be honest. But Bolton had they stole Owen Coyle off us all them years ago when we both got relegated from the Premier mm. League. Uh, and Coyle famously said, "The reason why I joined Bolton is because they are ten years ahead." Well, since then. Burnley have been in the Premier League for like eight out of ten years and Bolton have been all the way down in League One. So I will be checking that out, mate. Maybe he meant that in your ten years behind Bolton in your trajectory. So in ten years' time, you're going to be 17th in League One. Maybe yeah, that's what he meant. Mate, we have cracked that joke before. I remember when they went all the way I'm down knowing. to League Two and I was like, oh no, are we going to be in League Two in ten years? And I'm like, oh, that's fantastic. Uh, but anyway, we'll wrap it up there, mate. Obviously, we still need to get your show recorded, but yeah. absolute pleasure chatting to you, mate. I do appreciate you coming on. And as I always say when I'm wrapping this up, I know I've already said it, but I'll say it again. Good luck for the rest of the season, mate. And I genuinely mean that. It's good to have clubs like Portsmouth back in the Championship, but obviously after Saturday. Yeah, thank you. Same to you. <laughs>